George Bush and Tony Blair built on a long-standing relationship between the United States and Great Britain, one that Winston Churchill famously called the special relationship. This U.S.-British alliance is very powerful, and uh, there's a kind of unspoken rule that we stay on each other's side, don't ever go it alone. The Anglo-American relationship was forged in the dark days of World War II when Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill came together to beat back Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. But they were unlikely partners. Winston Churchill, he was a Tory, he was conservative, and he was the last uh, politician really standing up to the Nazi menace, and he desperately needed Franklin Roosevelt, who was a democratic progressive, who'd come from the opposite end of a, a philosophical, political spectrum. Roosevelt and Churchill were fundamentally different people, simply as human beings. Churchill was a warm-hearted man who loved to talk, loved to tell jokes. Roosevelt, on the other hand, was a secretive man who didn't even let his right hand know what his left hand was doing. They had differences, but they thought their commonality, their belief in the democratic um, principles of, of world governance, guided them through any kind of turbulence. But George W. Bush and Tony Blair, their political differences were also bridged by a shared international vision. Churchill, conservative, um, you know, FDR, progressive. It gets flipped with Blair and Bush because um, Bush was the conservative and Blair was more of the laborite, the progressive. They did really have a common set of values and a common belief in the importance of spreading freedom in the world and that freedom and democracy really were the antidote to the grim vision of the world that the terrorists were offering. Both Bush and Roosevelt were thrust into wars that began with attacks on American soil. The Battleship Arizona just after the explosion that shattered the mighty giant. A date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Americans have known surprise attacks, but never before on thousands of civilians. All of this was brought upon us in a single day, and night fell on a different world, a world where freedom itself is under attack. He had to confront a Pearl Harbor of his own with 9-11, and in both cases, immediately, America was thrust into a war. He recognized America could and would be still hit by what were sneak attacks, just like Pearl Harbor. The difference is now, it's asymmetrical war. FDR knew who the menace was, the Japanese and, 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 and Nazi Germany. Where for President Bush, when you had uh, a stateless terrorism being responsible for it, it was unclear where the United States, with the help of Great Britain, was going to strike back. But, it, but uh, the, as soon as we were bombed, President Bush became a wartime president at that very moment. Four days after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Hitler declared war on America. In years that followed, Roosevelt's collaboration with Churchill would become crucial to the Allied victory. In the absolutely key, crucial moments of the Second World War, they were helped enormously by a uh, close personal as well as political bond between Churchill and Roosevelt. Neither one of them gets it right, but together they make almost all the right decisions at the right times. The British and the Americans have not just gone to war, they have also worked to shape the post-war world. With Nazi Germany nearing defeat, urgent problems must be settled by the United States, Great Britain, and Russia. At the Yalta Conference in 1945, Roosevelt and Churchill looked beyond the war and attempted to mold a new Europe. It was the beginning of envisioning in a very, very serious way what the post-World War II world was going to look like. Sixty years later, when devising the surge, Bush and Blair looked to a counterinsurgency strategy to protect the Iraqi people and lay the foundation for the new Iraqi democracy. With Bush and the surge, it, it wasn't so much of redirecting the world's map, but it was trying to make a decision of, of how does one grab stateless terrorism by the scruff of the neck. The only way to do this properly is that you have to fundamentally get the public on your side. And the only way you can get the public on your side is to protect them. 
from World War II to the present, the special relationship has been cemented by a shared belief that free nations bear the responsibility for protecting and defending democracy around the globe. We tried again and again to prevent this war. But now we are at war. And we are going to make war. And firstly, they are in making war until the other side has had enough of it. You and I will act together to protect to defend our freedom. Basically, they created principles that we still live by today. What does democracy mean? It means freedom from want and freedom of religion. Uh, everywhere in the world, it means we won't accept totalitarianism in any guise. It means we want free and fair elections. The Prime Minister was always of the view that we needed to be ready to defend ourselves in a forward manner. You couldn't just sit at home and hope that you'd be safe couldn't just build walls, you had to go out there and defend yourselves where the threat really was. You find that also with George W. Bush in this belief that uh, you, you have to be, have muscular democracy, that you can't allow a world uh, where, where tyrants rule. Coming up, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher confront the communist threat. Standing before the Brandenburg Gate, every man is a German separated from his fellow men how their leadership brought down the Berlin Wall.